Right now we're facing a crisis of international proportion. It's a healthcare crisis, but it's also an economic crisis. It's going to have long-term impact for us. And we're going to see that the biggest impact is actually going to be acceleration of inequality. The systematic way that we have been built is not holding up. The foundation is cracking. Our duties remain the same. The fact that we should not leave anybody behind again. Many organizations have seen what the impact is of a sudden crisis and how we're able to better navigate this crisis today with the help of technology. And that means the reskilling and upskilling of your own workforce. Jobs of tomorrow are technologically enabled, but also extremely human centered. It's in the ability to work with technology easily. On the other hand, with this new way of working and especially remote work, we see that there is a huge need of emotional intelligence. We have really to invest a lot in people to guarantee their jobs, but also to allow them the mobility they need on an ever-changing uh, labor market. Eight out of 10 of the young people who are in low and middle income countries are going to have to be entrepreneurs. They're going to have to make jobs for themselves. Having creative curriculums and teaching creativity is enabling your learners to have transferable skills, resilience, mastery, collaboration, asking questions, why, how, when. This is what they need in order to thrive in any profession which they choose. The moment you incorporate marginalized segments of society, it changes the product offering, it changes the way that we think about supply chains. When you cater to the margins, the positive externalities in economic terms are pretty enormous. It is critical that leadership understand that the burden of responsibility of driving change starts at the top of the organization so that corporations can give back to the communities, make them more resilient as we deal with these issues around both economic and racial inequality. We need men and women leading the recovery because there is no way we can ever think that a world that is led by men is a world that is good for everybody. Now is the moment that we can think about how we use that possibility, the new ideas, the new technology, the new wealth, to really create social systems in which we can all flourish. We have the greatest brains, talent, resources in the world. There's no reason that we can't, and no excuses that it's too hard or too complicated. Good afternoon uh, from uh, Geneva. Uh, we have great guests with us here at uh, the Job Summit and this uh, Agenda Dialogue series. And um, also hello to all our listeners and watchers. Um, we are still uh, in the middle of a global pandemic, but we're seeing um, the light in the end of the tunnel. We know in many countries growth is back. But we are also reminded that uh, many countries will not even this year see pre-COVID uh, numbers when it comes to uh, the output uh, GDP. Uh, some large economies will, uh, by the end of this year, uh, have a higher GDP than, than before COVID, but that's not the case everywhere. This session is really about how we recreate growth and where will growth come from uh, in the future and how to make sure that this growth uh, is creating jobs, decent jobs, is more sustainable uh, than before, and also that we will address and have to address inequalities. As I said, uh, the panelists are great, so I'm sure they will be able to give us a lot of insights in where the growth will come from and how to uh, then uh, get out of this uh, crisis. I'm happy uh, to welcome Prime Minister of Belgium, uh, Prime Minister Alexander de Croo. I'm also very happy to uh, welcome the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, Heng Sui Kat. 
Also, Minister uh, uh, Nishimura uh, from uh, Japan. He is Minister for Economy and Fiscal Policy, but also in charge of uh, fighting COVID-19 uh, in uh, Japan. And then we have a Minister of Trade and Industry from uh, Rwanda, Beata Habiriamana. And we have also here from Switzerland, uh, Thomas G. Jordan. He is the Chairman of the Governing Board of the Swiss National Bank. Welcome. We have uh, Anila Denaj, Minister of Economy and Finance from Albania. Hello. And we have Alan Bajani, the CEO of Majid Al Futaim Holding. Uh, from the UAE, but investing uh, in the whole Middle East and other regions. And uh, not uh, least, Raj Shah, that is uh, the president of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation, former also uh, head of the USAID, and a lot of uh, other things. Welcome, all of you. Uh, so, I think the biggest challenge here now is to make sure that we will have all of you speaking uh, in the next hour and that we can also create some dialogue here. So please, um, in the response uh, to the first question, if you can then stick to like two and a half minutes, then we'll also make sure that you uh, can uh, speak to each other. I'm also very pleased to have my um, good colleague, uh, Sadia Sahidi. She's a managing director here at um, the forum, but also heading our center for the new economy and society and the brain behind the whole job summit. So uh, Sadia, I know you have huge expectations from this panel and uh, maybe two words from your side before we kick off with uh, Prime Minister De Croo on what you expect and what this session really is about. Thank you very much, Berge. Thank you for the opportunity and welcome to all of our guests um, online and all of the participants of the, of the panel. Um, we know that there are starting to be more positive projections around a return to growth, but there are some question marks about whether this is really the right form of growth and whether we don't need at this stage a new vision for where growth will come from. We know that in many developing economies, um, competing on the basis of cheap labor or aspiring to a manufacturing-led growth model may not be the way of the future. We also know that despite the fourth industrial revolution integrated into so many advanced economies, there hasn't necessarily been an, an equivalent rise in productivity across many of those developed economies. And so as we look towards the future, might we be able to focus on some new markets of tomorrow? The World Economic Forum has identified um, over 20 markets of tomorrow that relate to AI and data, and of course, many of the, the technologies that we're all familiar with, but also hydrogen and electric vehicles and plastics recycling and soil treatment. And then finally, the social economy, and that is the sectors that relate to childcare and elder care and reskilling and education and genetics and other aspects that relate to people. How might we be able to identify some of these markets of tomorrow? And two, how might we be able to get there with the right kind of public sector nudging combined with private sector investment? Those are the two core questions that we want to get into the discussion today. Back over to you, Bray. Thanks. No, thank you, Sadia. You you made my job really easy. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Alexander de Croo, you heard uh, the questions from Sadia. Where will growth be coming from in the years to come? And how can we secure that growth and making sure that it's also more inclusive and creating jobs? Over to uh, Belgium and Brussels. Yes, thank you. And thank you both for the, uh, for the great introduction. Um, of course, we are looking into growth starting from the situation in which we are which is an economic crisis, but I would say quite a typical economic crisis. We've had the discussion internally. Um, if you look at it at the macro level, who are today actually the casualties of, this, uh, of the economic crisis that we're in? Um, it's not so much the citizens. If you look at unemployment, we've seen in the Belgian economy, the unemployment numbers have actually not really gone up. It's not really the businesses either, because if you look at the, uh, the statistics on bankruptcies, bankruptcies actually have not gone up uh, at all. One potential casualty uh, could be public finances, of course, because we see throughout the Europe area, the euro area, that uh, debt levels has, have, gone, uh, have gone up. Um, but you could say, well, maybe that was the right choice because this was what needed to be done to preserve the economic, uh, the economic fabric. 
Um, what we are confronted with now on the short run, because we see that, as you indicated, Borge, um, the economic, we will be at, at, at pre-COVID uh, levels of, of output and, uh, and of growth by end of, uh, by end of this year. What we see right now is a supply side constraints. And the supply side constraints are quite acute. Uh, they are there obviously in labor markets, and we already, already see them uh, right now coming out of this, uh, out of, uh, out of the confinement. Uh, we also see them on the absorption side of investment. Uh, investments have kicked up to a level that was completely uh, unexpected. Uh, also, if you look at the, the, the confidence statistics, uh, consumer confidence and uh, business confidence is at the highest level since 2007. Quite unseen what we have uh, now. So on the short run, if you really want to see the growth and especially the, um, the, the job creation growth, we have some short-term um, uh, sub classic supply side uh, issues. And, and we, need to, we, need to, uh, we need to tackle that. On a bit, on the on, on the longer uh, the longer term, um, yes, obviously um, there will be some disruption. But from my perspective, there should also be some transition. Uh, disruption, yes, on the technological side. Disruption on the sustainability side, definitely. But if there is one place where we don't want disruption, it's on the social side. And no one likes social disruption. And coming out of this pandemic, I think this is the last thing we need, knowing all the the um, the polarization that we have seen throughout uh, European uh, society. So uh, that is going to be, I think, in the medium term, after the, 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 the short term supply side uh, constraints, bottlenecks that we have, is a transition that is, is a social transition. Uh, that means, yes, um, a lot of uh, training and, and, uh, and especially uh, on the job training, but also on the um, market regulation side. I know there's a lot of discussion on uh, taxations of multinationals and, and fair taxation in the digital world. I subscribe to that, I think it's important. But from my perspective, even more important than that is market concentration. And it is uh, market regulation and apply market regulation, which from my perspective is going to be one of the key elements to uh, translate this growth into something which is a social, uh, a social transition. If we want economic growth, this economic growth needs to be one where everyone is able to benefit from and from where everyone feels that it is, uh, it is something fair. Thank you uh, so much, Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Alexander, for uh, that very thoughtful um, intervention. Uh, let us then uh, move uh, to Asia. This uh, is the year where Asia is uh, getting uh, close to 50% of the global GDP. We know that uh, Singapore, as a very successful economy um, in Asia, uh, is also very much at the core of the global supply chains. And uh, Prime Minister De Croo just uh, alluded to uh, the challenges that we have also seen on the supply side piece. It has been our strategy that uh, it is just in time. But no, I think we're also focusing on in, just in case, because we also need to have access um, to uh, different components, for example, when it comes to uh, medicine, vaccination, and et cetera. Uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister, um, we are seeing numbers also now increasing uh, when it comes to growth in Singapore. Uh, and where do you see uh, future growth coming from? Well, okay, I think uh, COVID-19 has dealt a deep shock to the whole global economy, but it has also thrown up new needs and accelerated new trends. So addressing these needs and trends can provide new sources of growth and create good jobs. So let me share um, three suggestions. Uh, first, I think our top priority to restore growth and to protect lives is to contain the pandemic. Right now, we are in a race between how fast we vaccinate our people and how fast the virus mutates. The B1617 variant, for example, is twice as transmissible as the original strain. So we are really still at the a, at a thick of battle. So let's cooperate to share information, innovate on testing and distribute vaccines equitably through programs like COVAX. And I must say that the speed at which 
vaccines have been introduced is unprecedented. So we must push on with this momentum of innovation. And I think looking into the future, I think COVID is likely to become endemic. Uh, and for economic activities to resume, we need innovative measures to live with COVID. Um, second point I want to share is that COVID has accelerated the digital revolution. And to harness the potential of the digital economy, we need to harmonize standards and allow the trusted flow of data and facilitate cross-border transactions. So Singapore has signed digital economy agreements with several countries, and we hope that more can come on board so that we can keep our supply chain and our flow of information going. And third, COVID has also reminded us of the importance of our biodiversity and Earth's ecosystem. So to emerge stronger, we need to invest in green solutions for green recovery. And in Southeast Asia, it has potential to contribute to a green transition through nature-based solutions for carbon re removal. And up to 120 million hectares of land available for reforestation, we can contribute to a carbon removal of 3.5 gigatons a year. So this is around 10% of global carbon dioxide emissions. And a trusted exchange for the trading of carbon credits can catalyze investments in carbon removal. So by the end of this year, uh, an exchange called Climate Impact X will be launched in Singapore. So we must mobilize finance to promote green activities, such as green form of energy and infrastructure. And the government itself, the Singapore government is catalyzing this by issuing $15 billion uh, of green bonds. And to access this, I think most of all, we must focus on redesigning jobs and reskilling our people. Because I think with all of these changes going on, jobs are going to be uh, changed in very significant way. And in this regard, workers, businesses and governments all have important roles to play. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing this. And it is, of course, uh, something to think about what you mentioned also that the fact is that the strains that we are facing now when it comes to COVID-19 is uh, probably then double as infectious as the ones that we were facing uh, at the beginning. So uh, we're not out of the woods yet, I guess. And I, I saw your neighboring country, Malaysia, had to close down um, in the weekend. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that is affecting almost everyone. You know, countries which opened had to close in varying fashion. So we do are in a state of heightened alert. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's then um, move to uh, Japan uh, to... Um, Minister uh, Nishimura, I know uh, you're extremely busy. You're in charge of uh, the Japanese economy, but at the same time, you're also leading uh, the task force uh, dealing uh, with COVID-19. There is an Olympics uh, coming up. So very happy that you could join us, Japan being the third largest economy uh, in the world. Where do you see growth coming from uh, in the years to come, uh, Minister? So happy to see you. Thank you very much. So let me speak in Japanese. Um, yeah. uh, I know, 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 I ま、緊急事態宣言ということで大都市中心に感染を抑えるべく、え、あの、欧米のような厳しいロックダウンではありませんが、取り組んでいますけれども、え、10万人あたり1週間で18人程度ということで、え、欧米に比べてもかなり低
the COVID-19 really uh, identified many issues. Uh, one is digital, another one is green issues. Um, even in Japan, uh, we will be uh, investing into these two uh, different areas. And also um, we will be uh, drawing the power from the uh, private sector to really work together. So I would like to say today is that the uh, growth should be supported. Um, by the people because Japan uh, do not have uh, resources. Our resources, the uh, people. Even though we had a success in the past, that uh, we shouldn't be biased by the past um, success. We really have to uh, explore the new frontier. We really have to identify the issues and challenges. So um, solving the problems uh, by just looking at the challenge, but we really have to discover the challenge, hidden challenge and in hidden issues. We have to find the talent to do that. Uh, Japan is an island and uh, we are not really homogeneous a race, but uh, it is often said that we are very much closed nation, but now we have to welcome the uh, uh, diversified talent in our country. Fortunately, in case of sports, as you know, that uh, we have Hideki Matsuyama, uh, one in the uh, uh, Masters, and in the United States, Shohei Otani, uh, the uh, super uh, major uh, leaguers are really enjoying a great uh, uh, baseball games, both uh, batter and also the pitcher. And also Naomi Osaka, um, she won in the uh, US uh, Tennis Open and also Australian Open. Uh, she's in early uh, 20s and all of them are in 20s. And then uh, Japanese young stars are very active. And also last year, the startup, um, over 100 startups uh, went through the IPO since 2007. The UK, excuse me, US is about the 400 startups so that uh, we are almost the same level as those uh, uh, areas. Then traditional companies, um, let's say Sony uh, now uh, created the EB and uh, probably know the uh, uh, one of the uh, oldest traditional company, Idemitsu, again, they have introduced themselves into EB with a startup so that the, this kind of new waves are coming into Japanese market. Uh, youngsters and also women, I would like to talk about these points. Uh, youth, the young generation. Well, in the past, we had been based on the uh, seniority system and sometimes mainly uh, men's and uh, male workers in the mainstream. And But we really have to change that. We have to really open up the um, opportunities for young people and also women. And uh, we really have to uh, move, bring in the changes, especially the women in STEM, the uh, junior high school, um, the 15 year old, the Japanese uh, female students ranked as a second in the academic achievement. But when it comes to the entrance um, examination, many of them uh, shift towards the uh, liberal arts and only 17% for the STEM. Um, in the US and in UK, 40% STEM, and Germany, the 25% uh, in STEM. So that it is very limited in Japan uh, who go into STEM. We really have to explore the opportunities for the women. Uh, women in STEM area, uh, have to be really pursued in the future, and then that can really drive our future uh, plans. 28 Nobel laureates in Japan were all male. And uh, uh, in a few years, I really hope that uh, female uh, Nobel laureates uh, will be born out of Japan. So uh, in that sense, the Japanese innovation will be driven by the uh, youth and also women and also women in STEM. And I must create the environment so that they can thrive in the future. Arigato, thank you, Arigato, thank you so much, uh, Minister. And I share uh, also your wish for a lot of women Nobel laureates uh, from uh, Japan uh, in the years uh, to come. And I think you have such an important point when you underline uh, the importance of uh, startups and innovation and incubation when we no want uh, growth back. And remember, if you look at uh, 10 companies with the highest global market cap today, uh, seven out of 10 did not exist 20 years ago. 
So uh, many of the startups are the future uh, companies that I guess will also dominate in Japan. Um, we'll come back to you, uh, Minister. Let's then, uh, Minister, let's then um, uh, move to uh, Rwanda. Uh, there has been a uh, developed economy so far. Rwanda is uh, a successful developing uh, economy, but still a developing economy. We know that of the 15 trillion US dollars that has been launched in stimulus, not happened since the Second World War, only 1% of the 15 trillion US dollars in fiscal stimulus has been coming uh, in developing countries. So, um, Minister Beata uh, Habiari Mana, uh, Minister for Trade and Industry in uh, Rwanda. Uh, I know growth is back now uh, in Rwanda. I think you cope well uh, with the COVID. Uh, of course, uh, everything is uh, relative, but where do you see the growth uh, in the future for your country and uh, for the African continent? Thank you. Uh, as you said, uh, Rwanda is aspiring to become a middle country by 2035 and even an upper income by 2050. Uh, and we think that from this pandemic, uh, we have been learning a lot. Uh, and especially in terms of uh, reboosting the economy and creating jobs, uh, we have been focusing on a couple of areas, but I can share some of them we think should be the source of a future um, job. The first one is uh, that you have seen uh, with this pandemic that the approach for the trade should be through the liberalization. The liberalization, diversification of trade uh, as a country and also as a continent, we fully believe in the African continent of free trade area as one of the tools we, which can lead to have uh, these regional value chains and uh, it would take the countries moving from just a national level to really uh, a regional and even a continental value chain. But we also think in the same time that uh, with this pandemic have learned a little bit more and uh, in a speedy way that uh, the way uh, African countries were considered as uh, exporters or producers of what I would call like primary products and primary services should be shifting from that stage to add the value um, products and added the value services produced in those countries. And it's where, as a country, as Rwanda, we have decided to, to go through this pandemic through an accelerator for manufacturing. And uh, when I say about manufacturing, we, we have been able to learn how to start with the essentials, what I would call like the must-have products and services each country should have to be able to satisfy its population. And there it englobes also um, uh, all the social and healthcare manufacturing. It comes to vaccines. We have learned a lot about through the pandemic. And uh, we think that this might be also a source. We have been experiencing it as a country and have been seeing uh, for the short term uh, some fruits uh, from those strategies uh, encouraging the manufacturing area in what we are good at, like agribusiness, light manufacturing, construction, but also uh, the healthcare manufacturing field. But you also think that by talking about the, the manufacturing, we can't let aside the green industrialization. Uh, though the decision is one key uh, element, we fully believe that green industrialization is one of the key uh, sources uh, because we can't use to do the same thing like we did in the past. And uh, we believe that Africa is also in a good position to have nature-based um, industrialization and products. The other point when I would like to share with you is that uh, as we, we look into a need for policy reforms, uh, we also have to think about uh, materializing uh, those, those, those policy reforms or having an operational instrument uh, to materialize it. I will just give you an example. Like in Rwanda, we have established what we call Kigali Innovation City, which is a mixed use. It's a place with a master plan. It's an innovation city, and it seeks to facilitate the development of Pan-African talents from all over the continent and act as a technology innovation hub. And uh, this Kigali Innovation City is housing international universities, technology companies, biotech firms, and we think that it will keep attracting technology companies from all over the world to Rwanda to create an innovation ecosystem and further as we wish in our plan to have a knowledge-based economy. 
we think that we can't go without that. We can't go without that. And we believe that not just as Africa, but also in other places which are uh, still under development, that might be some of the sources I can share with the panel. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister. We heard that there is uh, some optimism, even if uh, uh, we are very, uh, very uh, sober about the situation. Um, we uh, also uh, are concerned, of course, that around the corner there can be some infl uh, inflation uh, pressure. We also know that the world is uh, no more indebted than we have been in a long time. So maybe we should go to Switzerland and uh, to uh, you, Thomas uh, J. Jordan. Uh, you're the head of the Swiss uh, National Bank, and I guess uh, you might be a bit worried about future inflationary uh, pressure, but also uh, the indebtedness. Uh, but I guess there was no real alternative uh, to a massive stimulus in the situation we were facing. So what's your, what, what keeps you up at night? Well, thank you, uh, Borke and uh, Sadia, for inviting me to this panel. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, I will shortly come back to your question regarding inflation and also the debt level. But let me say a little bit about possible headwinds for tomorrow's uh, markets. And I believe one point that is really important is the division of labor between the private sector and the public sector. And if this division of labor is not optimal, if it's suboptimal, that could be a serious headwind. So uh, the, the good collaboration between the public sector and the private sector is really important. I think it's key for our social, political, and economic stability of our countries. But at the same time, I'm deeply convinced that the public sector should not run the economy. And uh, we talked before, uh, where are those markets? And uh, I think uh, the public sector is not particularly well equipped to deliver the next big thing. So the public sector should really concentrate on the framework, on the conditions for the economy, but the businesses the private sector is much better placed to spot those uh, important changes and also to identify these uh, new markets. Of course, there is this uh, possibilities of public-private partnerships. They play an important role, but they have to design very uh, well. Otherwise, they can be uh, really counterproductive and also limit the competition. You heard that also before the limited competition in the in the private sector. When I look at Switzerland, how we dealt with the, the economic crisis. Uh, we saw that uh, the private sector and the public sector both played a very important role. Uh, the public sector uh, responded very quickly, also with, uh, I think, bigger budget uh, and uh, also with uh, increasing the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank. But that was always all largely through the traditional function of the public sector. When, when it comes really to innovation, technical innovation, the private sector was much better uh, and uh, much more innovative. And a very good example is here the development of the coronavirus tests, but also of the vaccines. So consequently, and I'm deeply convinced that that, in order to look at these uh, markets of uh, tomorrow, uh, government should avoid pursuing, pursuing an industrial policy, but really let the markets find the new equilibrium. And uh, now let me come back to these uh, economic conditions and, and to your questions regarding inflation and uh, public debt. Uh, it's clear that uh, um, also macroeconomic conditions play an important role. So low inflation and stable uh, public finances, but also financial stability is, is very important. So a sound fiscal position ensures that the government is able to fulfill the task all the time and also to re react to new shocks. And uh, price stability, in my view, is also very important. Uh, it's especially important for also lower income groups in, in that uh, perspective. What, what is the, the risk of having an increase in inflation? Big discussion at, at this moment. Uh, personally, I'm not that worried at this moment. Um, it's more likely to see a, a temporary increase uh, but not yet really a big concern. But of course, uh, we have to be very attentive to that. And uh, when especially the output caps are narrowing everywhere, and uh, several others alluded to that already, I think that we have to be uh, attentive to that and uh, also see that the public debt remains on a sustainable level. 
and especially also a certain reaction of central banks if inflation will go up uh, too quickly. So otherwise, we will see a big increase in interest rates, and that would be also counterproductive for uh, the markets of tomorrow. So let me conclude just again saying that uh, for the markets of tomorrow, we need structural reforms that ensure good framework conditions for firms, and especially also foster entrepreneurship. Otherwise, I think it will be very difficult to achieve the objective of inclusive, innovative, and sustainable economies. Thank you, Borke. No, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, I think this is a, a nice segue into you, Alan uh, Bojani. I guess this is also good music in your ears. Um, the governor uh, of the central bank is underlining also the importance of the private sector here uh, in uh, the recovery. So where uh, can the private sector lead and uh, how can we make sure that the private sector also take responsibility for a sustainable, more inclusive uh, growth when uh, we are recovering uh, from the crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Borge, for having me. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I totally subscribe to what I've heard so far. I think uh, we have a big role to play as, as, as a private sector in making sure that we lead the way in terms of the transformation that's ongoing. We all agree that uh, COVID has accelerated so many trends and they have reset a lot of the uh, existing beliefs uh, around the importance of fast tracking liberalization opening up uh, opening up to better trade and making sure that we are able to work together as uh, a stakeholder economy rather than continue to uh, drive for single siloed objectives uh, this new reality is more established than ever the need for uh, sustainable economic growth to come back is there the question is uh, growth is coming it's a fact uh, is it going to be sustainable? Is it going to be equitable? Are we going to channel in the right way? Or are we going to go and at the end of the day do more of the same? I deeply believe that uh, we have a very important role to play. Different regions in the world have different priorities, although they, have, they are facing similar situations. So in certain geographies, we should continue to lead the way and continue to actually put in place the infrastructure that is needed to, to embrace the fourth industrial re revolution, to benefit from this acceleration of trends and let go of existing beliefs that have been, to a large extent, undermining real economic growth. In other parts of the world, I, I, uh, I agree with what I've heard so far. We absolutely need to make sure that we are, we're getting the right type of growth and we are uh, keeping our eyes wide open in terms of establishing or, or I would say getting to the right equilibrium between the private and the public sector and making sure that uh, the, 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 the new phase of uh, that you are going into, uh, although it has seen a very important or magnified role for the public sector in taking charge, making sure that uh, this uh, uh, interventionism in a lot of ways in regulating public life, in regulating the economies more than ever and, uh, uh, and individuals' behaviors, what you can do and what you can't do, uh, although acknowledging the, the big economic impact, is something that you are letting go of and, and, and giving back the private sector uh, uh, its fair uh, share and role as a key player or, or, or on, of making things happen and uh, kicking a proper, uh, a proper uh, economic growth, making sure that you are reforming our economies to be really uh, uh, businesses that are operating in an environment where we're taking care of each and every stakeholder. It's not just about making money and the business of business is not only making it's not only business, not only making money. There is more that we need to do, and we need to make sure that all our stakeholders are finding uh, what's in it for them uh, in this new reality. Unless we do that, we are going to be less equipped than we have been. And I say, uh, I am, I'm, I'm aware of what they say, less equipped than we have been when we entered this pandemic uh, and when this pandemic actually took us by storm. Uh, I, I would not take it for a given to say that, uh, you know, we're, we're better prepared. I wouldn't take it for, for, uh, for uh, a given to say next time we'll do better. We don't know what next time is going to be. But the one thing is for sure, we need to be stronger together in order to face then whatever the next pandem pandemic is going to be, to, to be about. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Alan. I think it's an important reminder that we have to build uh, resilience, resilience in coping also with uh, both predictable and more unpredictable uh, crisis. Let me now uh, turn to Raj Shah, uh, president of Rockefeller um, Foundation and also uh, someone that knows uh, development really well, but uh, also uh, is um, um, a great uh, has great knowledge in the field uh, between uh, public and uh, private sector, how to mobilize resources and think out of the box. So in this crisis, uh, Raj, well, what are your observations? Well, it's great to be with you and I appreciate the prior comments. I think we've heard a number of uh, comments that all illustrate one big point, which is that we are looking at potentially a decade of a great divergence where nations that have had high levels of access to vaccines and immunizations and have had the ability to invest 20 or 30 percent of GDP in recovery and stimulus uh, in a manner that is fiscally uh, manageable have, will, have been able to and will be able to imagine a fairly rapid economic recovery over the course of the next months and years. Uh, and at the same time, as we've seen from estimates from the IMF in particular, uh, but also the World Bank, the nations that are lower income around the world that house potentially four or five billion people uh, have simply not been able to do that. They haven't had the access to vaccines uh, and we're seeing big waves of new variants cause uh, significant consequences in India and Africa and Latin America now. Uh, they have not, emerging economies have done 6% uh, of GDP as stimulus and recovery financing, and developing countries have done only 2% compared to the 20 to 30% that wealthier nations have been able to do. So that's why the World Bank is estimating that as many as 500 million people will be pushed back under an expanded definition of the poverty line. And it's also why we should be concerned that we, we won't get a climate deal, we won't have the ability to do large-scale global cooperation to address the challenges that face us if there's this massive divergence. I think the good news is there are opportunities for both public and private collaboration to come together and produce real solutions. We at Rockefeller have released just yesterday a global vaccination approach that has the support of all the public sector, but also all the private sector partners to achieve global herd immunity by the end of next year, which would dramatically change the growth path for 70 to 80 countries around the world. Uh, we know that the International Monetary Fund has proposed uh, potentially two rounds of $650 billion of additional special drawing rights allocations. If those are in fact passed uh, through the G20 and through the IMF board, and then wealthier nations donate a few hundred billion dollars of their allocations to developing nations, either in concessional lending or grants, we know that that several hundred billion dollars can make a huge impact in helping countries have the fiscal space to invest in a reasonable green and equitable recovery. And we frankly know that we have a major public-private global financing opportunity for the world's multilateral banking system to reimagine how we meet global climate needs through new forms of innovative public-private finance. And so, so these are the kinds of challenges that are, are necessary. They're actually affordable now that we know that you know, nations can in fact uh, borrow and spend at a time of deep crisis. It's just important that we approach this with the mindset that we're all in it together and that when wealthier nations start to recover and move beyond COVID, uh, we don't forget that there are 70 to 80 other nations that could become a long-term reservoir of dangerous new variants of COVID-19 if we don't actually invest in some of these global partnerships. No, thank you, Raj, and thank you for your leadership on this. And uh, thank you also for reminding us that the cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of action here. As you were referencing IMF numbers that came out the other day, uh, 50 billion investments in vaccination could give a yield of 9 trillion. So what are we waiting for? So let's now uh, go to the last speaker and we'll uh, go back uh, to um, the Prime Minister. After this, we um, first, uh, we, we do have Anila Danosh, a Minister for uh, Economy and um, Finance of Albania. You listen to uh,
discussion. Minister, we'd love to hear also our comments uh, from Tirana. Thank you very much for this opportunity. COVID-19 has shown to be a major challenge for everyone and uh, for every country's uh, budget. Growth, debt, poverty levels have been questioned. And in Albania, we managed to maintain a good equilibrium, but we need to plan accordingly during this transformation period for a sustainable future. This, continue, uh, this transformation is driven mainly by technological change, in agriculture and manufacturing being the key sectors for Albanian economic development and job creation. Direct and uh, indirect support from government might be considered during this transformation period for SMEs, which needs this uh, more than ever. However, we should not neglect that higher budget allocation for health and social government support schemes is also required. In Albania, there are several new opportunities for the future. First and above most, attracting new nearshoring projects, benefiting from a diversification of international value chains and building up regional value chains. We are talking uh, not only in Albania, but in Western Balkan countries for a much bigger market than each of our countries. So we're talking about West Balkan uh, market and regional value chains uh, should not be neglected. In this context, the uh, Albanian government is responding through a set of measures, both uh, locally and regionally, as I mentioned, and for a period that should exceed the next 10 years. Emphasizing innovation and know-how, knowledge-driven development is key. And uh, to this context, I think professional education is a very key important element that we all consider during this transformation period. In doing so, the upskilling and reskilling of the workforce remain crucial. And it is also part of our plans to develop the education system in the next 10 years in Albania in a higher level including and putting a lot of focus in ICT, as well as creating uh, a lot of support schemes, grants and fiscal support schemes for development of ICTs in the near future in Albania. Further, we are also putting an extra effort on STEAM education. And these are just examples to say that for us, young generations should have um, a future that looks towards uh, digitalization in order that supports the transformation of SMEs, but government's role is key and budget allocation for support schemes for SMEs, health and social schemes, it should be high in the agenda. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you, uh, Minister, uh, thank you for that. We have now uh, 10 more minutes to go, so I would like to uh, have uh, some uh, short uh, comments. I'll go to you, uh, Prime Minister Alexander de Croo. Uh, first, you listen to uh, all uh, the worries, but also uh, some of the aspirations here. So um, there are also some uh, silver linings, but it's so much that we have to deal with at the same time. So sometimes it feels like squaring a circle. We have to uh, mitigate CO2 emissions. At the same time, we need to have growth. So we have to decouple that. Then you have to have decent jobs. But at the same time, you also have to uh, secure um, also uh, that there are opportunities for developing countries. But you also need to create jobs in developed countries. So there is really, really a very complex picture that we're faced with. So. Um, how uh, do you how, how do you feel like leading in such a crisis, and where where do you feel that the silver linings are, and what what are the areas where we really have to avoid making major mistakes coming out of this uh, crisis in the stronger way? Well, it it, it feels indeed like a, like a huge endeavor, um, but fortunately, over the last twelve months, we've shown that we can tackle huge endeavors. And that's what we did in the development, the production, and the distribution of vaccines. Uh, what we have done there is something which was unimaginable. 12 months ago, no one would have thought that we would have been able uh, to do this. And, and we did it, and we did it in a, in a safe way. And we did it by um, having everyone bring to the table what they're best at. And that was by um, uh, uh, listening to academia and, and, and using the, the work that had been done. Um, as governments uh, play the role we should play by providing uh, stability and providing uh, the volume that is required. 
and and making space for the for the private sector and 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 the world economic forum often talks about this multi-stakeholder approach i think what we did in vaccines is 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 an incredible showcase of what is possible if everyone brings to the table what they're best at and and i think that is that is the golden learning uh, out of the last 12 months and this is the way how we will tackle uh, climate change and this is the way how we will tackle uh, job creation uh, in a digital space and 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 so many other of those endeavors that looked impossible i think uh, what you did with vaccines it showed us the way no thank you so much and i i think uh, you're so right we developed vaccines in less than a year garments put funding on the table but the pharmaceuticals uh, created these vaccines in um, also such a short time i think you're right also about uh, climate change we have to also uh, rely on new uh, technologies and and the private sector in that uh, respect to to make sure that we we meet uh, the targets for net uh, zero. Um, Deputy Prime Minister um, Heng uh, Svi uh, Kat, uh, Singapore, maybe you want to comment on, on uh, the opportunities and the learnings? Well, I think uh, one point which comes across across all these uh, various interventions is that is the importance of, I think Thomas uh, put it very well, that the optimal, ballot, optimal distribution of responsibilities between the public sector and the private sector and the private sector is very good at innovation, and innovation is a theme that cuts across all our interventions. Now, how do we encourage uh, the private sector to continue to innovate, to find new solutions? And I fully agree with Prime Minister De Croo that the vaccination story and the speed at which the vaccination vaccines were produced is quite a remarkable story compared to the flu in you know, a century ago. Now, the other aspect uh, is that the role of the government, and I think the role of government in creating the enabling conditions, and even in the case of the vaccines, we must not forget that it was the huge investments that governments around the world have put into basic sciences, into unraveling the, the genome, into uh, all the basic research that's going on in our universities that enabled these vaccines to be developed and in the training of people. So I think that optimal division of labor between the government, which has to invest in basic research, education, in uh, promoting a basic infrastructure, while creating the conditions for the private sector to innovate, to be creative, and to organize itself to get the work done is very critical. So I think in this uh, ongoing work, we must ensure that Government continue to play that role of building bridges across economies while the private sector can make the best use of these bridges. Thank you. No, well, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, Sadia Sahidi, you listen uh, to this uh, conversation. You and your team has uh, created the whole uh, job summit and laid the foundation for uh, an insightful and hopeful learning, learningful uh, discussion on where the growth can come from uh, in the future and how growth can also contribute in meeting the sustainable development goals and also be helpful uh, when it comes to um, then mitigating uh, CO2 emissions. So uh, I'll give the floor to you, uh, Sadia, uh, to try to sum up this uh, rich conversation uh, in uh, two minutes. No, no pressure. Um, so I think one very clear takeaway is that first and foremost, we still need to continue to tackle the health crisis. It is by no means over. And until we beat this health crisis everywhere, we don't really manage to beat it anywhere. So that is one part that is absolutely clear and calls for vaccine equity came through the conversation. Uh, a second element is managing the headwinds and watching very, very carefully um, some of those headwinds, including rising debt, including the possibility of rising inflation, and ensuring that we are keeping a very close eye on those risks and managing them. The third element is, where do we now go from this era of much bigger government that we've now entered? And I think we heard a couple of different views. We heard that we should not necessarily go down a direction of industrial policy in the way that we've thought of in the past, 
But we also heard that there is a strong role for governments to create the right enabling conditions and be a sort of co-investor along with the private sector if we want to create those markets of tomorrow. And within those markets of tomorrow, there is enormous amounts of potential and possibility. And the example of vaccines and how quickly they were created based on the long-term research and development from both government and business is exactly the type of example we need to look to in co-creating new markets of tomorrow. And finally, fourth, the need for not just the capital and not just the enabling conditions, but also the human capital that is necessary for any of this to work and to ensure that this creates an inclusive and sustainable recovery. We will need the right kind of education, the right kind of skills, the right kind of inclusion, the right kind of care infrastructure, and finally, the right kind of safety nets. So that is essentially what I am taking away from this conversation and much of what the World Economic Forum will continue to provide a platform for in the next 18 months, um, in especially to work with public sector leaders and private sector leaders to create national accelerators that address the topics of innovation, jobs, skills, and inclusion. Thank you, Berge. No, thank you so much, uh, Sadia. Thank you for a uh, great summing up. Um, it has been uh, also um, a very uh, insightful um, conversation between uh, the leaders. So thank you all um, for contributing. And uh, we're very uh, pleased that you were able to join us. And we're looking forward to seeing you all uh, soon. Thank you so much from Geneva.